You may have noticed in uh, the liturgy, I certainly did, uh, this constant uh, reference to remembrance. We ask God to remember us for life. We ask him to remember on our behalf, the Messiah, the son of Jesse, it's constantly talking about remembrance. So today I'd like to give a brief drush on faithfulness and remembrance. And this will be familiar to some of you. I talked about this, uh, I think in 2019. And um, here's a slight amplification of this. Don't forget to remember. The story of Baron Hannah and God's miraculous answer to her prayer is joined in our tradition to the story of Avraham and Sarah and how God answered their prayer by bringing them a son, Isaac. In both of these stories, we encounter this major theme of the High Holy Days, remembrance. And we need to know uh, the, these things. God remembered Hannah by giving her the son for whom she prayed. The text speaks of this. Elkanah remembered his yearly vow. He went up every year, and it says it's because of a vow. That's interesting. He remembered. Hannah remembered her vow about Shmuel. She promised that she'd give this son to God uh, and to be a servant at the, at the, temp, at the uh, tabernacle of Shiloh. She remembered, and she did that. Adonai remembered his promise to Avraham and Sarah. And Avraham remembered to circumcise his son Yitzchak. In each case, what we are looking at is the same quality we see highlighted in our liturgy and in our Torah reading, faithfulness. God remembered Hannah because he was faithful to hear her prayers, especially as they were joined by the blessing of the high priest, Eli. Elkanah remembered his yearly vow to go up to Shiloh and worship God there with his family. Hannah remembered her vow to give her son to the service of Adonai if God would only hear her prayer and grant her a son, which he did, and so she did what she promised. Faithfulness requires that we remember. I'll say it again. Faithfulness requires that we remember. If we don't remember what we have promised, how can we be faithful to keep those promises? How can we become aware, therefore, when we have wandered from the paths of faithfulness, if we have forgotten what we promised? We need to remember things, not only what we've promised, but also what God has done. This is why our tradition warns us against making vows, reminding us that it is better not to vow at all than to make a vow and not to keep it. Despite all the wonderful gadgets we have, and I love my gadgets, my iPads, I have a couple of old ones, one more new, uh, my computer, my cell phone, which is now 10 years old, and I've got to get another one. Despite all the wonderful gadgets we have, and I am particularly devoted to my computer and my iPad, despite all of these assisting devices to help us remember, I think, I think that most of us, rather than remembering, enjoy using these devices to be distracted, and we even prepare to forget. I grew up in a home where it was convenient to forget obligations because the social consequences of, of, of not meeting an obligation were great. Being distracted means that we want to forget. Irving Berlin, that nice Jewish boy who lived a hundred years, wrote, wrote a thousand songs. I've heard that he's been called there was once a documentary that where, where they said in the documentary, not only did Irving Berlin have a role in American music, he was American music. This Jewish boy uh, wrote the world, the most famous of Christmas songs. <laughs> it's interesting. 
He wrote the most famous of Easter songs. He wrote a lot of stuff. He was he was really something. But uh, he also wrote this song. Remember the night, the night you said, I love you. Remember? Remember you vowed by all the stars above you. Remember? Remember we found a lonely spot and after I learned to care a lot, you promised that you'd forget me not, but you forgot to remember. <laughs> Man, the words of the old songs are just, they knock me out. Remember we found a lonely spot and after I learned to care a lot, you promised that you'd forget me not, but you forgot to remember. It's a love song. And we have a love relationship with God, and it's no more honorable for us to forget what we promised to remember in our relationship with God than it is in our relationship with an earthly loved one. So during the 10 days of awe, I suggest three things to remember, and you could probably suggest some others. First, remember the faithfulness of God. The reason that we owe him obedience, the reason we owe him thanks, the reason we ask him to forgive us is that he's a faithful God. He deserves the best of which we are capable and far, far, far more than that. And we must remember the faithfulness of God when we are frightened because of our sins, when we are discouraged. We need to remember the faithfulness of God. Secondly, we need to remember the promises we have made and broken, and therefore to remember our own unfaithfulness. Uh, the, ten, the ten days of awe, uh, many of us, uh, many of our people, find the services long to endure. And I was just thinking during our service today, which was longer than our services ever are, uh, what do you do with a long service? And I think that what we do with a long service is we should really intensify our engagement with it. Because these, this liturgy this morning was magnificent. The standard liturgy is even more magnificent. And it's not something to endure if you will remember to give yourself to it, to really let it inhabit you and for you to inhabit the liturgy. But secondly here, the promises we have made and broken, we need to remember our own unfaithfulness and the liturgy really helps us to do that. It's an important thing to remember because the relationship is important, because God deserves better, because we contaminate and erode and destabilize the relationship when we constantly forget to remember. Finally, number three, we need to remember the staggering magnitude of what God has done to welcome us back and to spiritually enrich those who will remember to turn from their wayward ways, seeking full forgiveness by the means he's provided. That passage that was read by Erica uh, from the, the, the end of the book of Romans, uh, it stuns me. I suggest you reread it. Paul is, is stumbling all over himself. He's tripping all over himself, trying to give us a glimpse of the extraordinary, and that's not a good enough word, the incalculable, the unfathomable, the unimaginable grace and mercy of God to sinners. He is, he is straining the boundaries of language in order to try to give us a whiff of the, the extent of God's grace, his kindness, his mercy, his compassion, 
to us. Uh, we hardly, uh, we hardly understand it. We hardly know it. We, we hardly appreciate it, I think, because number one, we don't like to look at our sins. And number two, in our culture, the word forgiveness has been cheapened because relationships are cheapened. But the relationship with God is the most precious relationship conceivable beyond conception. He's able to do uh, in us that which is exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or even think. That's the way Paul talks about it. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, not just a little bit more, not just a lot more, exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or even think. Think about that for a while during this season, that the mercies of God are not just, he says, oh yeah, I forgive you, okay, don't let it bother you. No, it's, it's, it's much, much more than that. It's kind of like the father of the prodigal son. The son finally comes to his senses. He's feeding pigs in a foreign land. He's wasted his inheritance on wine, women, and song. And he realized, what, he says, what am I, stupid? He says, my servants, my father's servants live better than I. I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to say, I'm not worthy to be considered your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And when he's on the way, his father looks up and he runs to meet him. And then what does he do? Exceedingly abundantly beyond all that the prodigal could ask or even think. That's what it is. He he puts a robe on him, a robe of status, like Joseph's uh, coat of many colors. He puts sandals on his feet. Uh, he makes a mensch out of him. He puts a ring of authority on his hand. And then he has a, a, a lavish party. And no, I, I sympathize with the elder brother who says, Dad, I don't get this. You know, I've always been with you. I've always been faithful to you. I've always done what you said. And this is true. This is not a lie. He says, and this son of yours who wasted his money on prostitutes and, and, and drink, uh, feeding pigs, for him you throw a party? The, the uh, older brother couldn't understand the mercies of his father. And we don't understand the mercies of God. We don't fully appreciate it. We never could fully appreciate it. But it's one of the things we need to remember. God's faithfulness, our broken promises, and the staggering magnitude of God's mercy. But we need to remember something else, that uh, the mercies of God are meant to call us to repentance. Just a brief summary. Remember God's faithfulness to us. Remember our unfaithfulness to him. Remember and prove faithful to his staggering provision for us, living faithful lives. You see, if we understand the dimensions of his mercy, it's going to inspire in us an astounding life. People who live a mediocre life as so-called servants of God really don't understand the mercy they've experienced. They don't. If they did, they, they would live a different kind of life. The goodness of God is meant to move us to repentance. So during these days, don't just remember your sins. Don't just remember your, your unfaithfulness. Don't just remember the, uh, the, the faithfulness of God. Remember his mercies. Remember to contemplate the astounding dimensions of his mercies. Look at the liturgy. Look at the end of Romans chapter 8 and ponder that. Because as you get a glimpse of the goodness of God, it will really move you to repentance. Let's not forget to remember. Shabbat Shalom. 
and Shana Tova.